Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. So this episode is set to come out on the 17th of September, which oddly enough is National Cheeseburger Day. And that has nothing to do with books. So let's go back back a couple days to the 15th of September, which does have to do with books because that was the 130th birthday of Agatha Christie. Even if you don't read mysteries at all, you've probably heard of Agatha Christie. She wrote 66 full-length detective novels, plus enough short stories to fill 14 collections. Uh, She's known as the Duchess of Death, the Mistress of Mystery, and the Queen of Crime. But, as you'll soon find out, she maybe should have been also given the title Queen of Hanging Ten. But before we start, I'm just going to put in a quick request for you to either leave a review for the Book Owl podcast on whatever app you're listening in right now, or to head to Podchaser and leave a review, or to just share the show with a fellow book nerd. Any little bit can really make a difference. After all, if the Book Owl doesn't get enough attention, she starts plucking out her feathers. And believe me, no one wants a bald book owl. Also, as I'm recording this, we've got wildfires raging not far from my home and the air is super smoky. So smoky, the air quality has been listed as off the charts hazardous. So if my voice ends up sounding a bit dry or cracky, that's why. All right, on to Agatha. She was born to a fairly wealthy family in the English countryside in 1890, and while it does sound like she mostly had a happy childhood, it was also kind of a strange one. See, her mom didn't really think Agatha should be allowed to read until she was at least eight years old, and I don't know why she chose that age. Agatha also had two siblings who were about a decade older than her, but they'd been sent off to boarding school. And with her siblings away, plus them being so much older than her anyway, she was basically left home alone with only her parents and pets as company. Like any lonely kid, Agatha spent the time making up imaginary friends, and she also spent some of that time with books, and the precocious little Agatha thwarted her mom and taught herself to read by the time she was five. When Agatha was about 11, her dad died after a bunch of financial setbacks. They basically just did his health in. Agatha's mom took the death really hard and she just absolutely clung to her youngest daughter. And the two formed a super strong bond that would come to throw Agatha for a loop later in her life. So then when Agatha turns 12, she finally gets to go to school. But then after having had the freedom of her homeschooling, she finds out the classroom structure is just too rigid and she just, she doesn't do well. During this time, she's been, you know, sort of venturing more out into, you know, the neighborhood and stuff. And she's been making a few friends and they've been creating and performing little plays So it's thought that maybe Agatha would do well in the theater. So despite their growing money worries, Agatha is sent to Paris at the age of 15. And this is to so she can train in voice work and piano. Well, it turns out, no surprise, since she's grown up mostly alone, Agatha does not do well performing in front of people she doesn't know. And it's not long before she abandons her career in the theater and heads back to England. But, of course, we know Agatha, she didn't become a super star actress or anything. She became a writer. And it's when she's 18 that she writes her first short story. And this thing, it really does sound like the oddest story. It's full of spiritualism, which was popular at the time and dream sequences, and explorations of madness. Uh, And she writes several other stories in a similar sort of genre, and she sends them off for publication. Well, they were all rejected. Eh, Don't worry, Agatha. We've all been there. So it's also around this time that Agatha's mom's health isn't doing so great. And she's told to, you know, go spend the winter in a dry climate. So her and Agatha head off to Egypt. And it's this trip that inspires her first novel, which she titles Snow Upon the Desert. 
Yeah, like the short stories, this novel was also rejected. And she tried and tried, and she even enlisted a family friend who was also a writer, and he introduced her to his agent, who also rejected the novel. But he did see some potential in Agatha's writing and advised her to write another book and see how it went. Well, meanwhile, Agatha is starting to break out of her shell a little bit. She's going to parties, she's going dancing, she's roller skating. Yeah, I found that weird too. And she's meeting boys, many of whom propose marriage. But it's Archibald Christie, who she meets at a dance near her home in 1912, who ends up just sweeping her off her feet. They're engaged within three months after meeting for the first time. But neither has the money to marry and set up a household, so the engagement just kind of fizzles for a while. Then World War II breaks out. Um, Archie's an aviator with the Royal Flying Corps, and he gets called up in August 1914. On his leave in December of that year, the two decide there's no time like the present, and they get married. And But Agatha, she just really doesn't see her husband for the duration of the war. She instead spends her time volunteering at the Red Cross. And it's during this period, during this volunteer time, that we start building on what truly began influencing Agatha's future writing. Because while she's at the Red Cross, Agatha earns a qualification as an apothecary's assistant, and she begins working in the dispensary and learning about poisons. And it was also during the war, while Archie was away, that Agatha wrote her first novel featuring Hercule Poirot. And the persnickety little Belgian was inspired both by the Belgian refugees near where she was living, but also by the Belgian she was treating at the Red Cross. And I do kind of wonder what those Belgians thought of the character if they ever ended up reading the book. So it has been quite a few years since Agatha had written anything, right? So what stirred up the writing bug again, and why did she choose to go into mysteries? Well, part of it had to do with her love of detective stories by Wilkie Collins and Arthur Conan Doyle. But mainly, it had to do with her sister betting her that she couldn't write a convincing detective story. Well, Agatha won that bet. The Mysterious Affair at Styles not only got published, but was even lauded by the pharmaceutical journal for her accuracy with the poisons used in the book. And her pharmacy training really does pay off, because over half of Agatha's novels use poison as the murder weapon. So eventually, World War I ends, and Archie returns home in 1918, and married life finally begins for them. They have their only child, Rosalind, in 1919, and... Archie, he's basically working in a low-paying financial job while Agatha is writing. Not long after Rosalind was born, she published her first Tommy and Tuppence novel, and then followed that up with another Hercule Poirot book, and all this was within a couple years. I mean, the woman was on a roll. Which meant it was time for her to go on tour. And this wasn't really a book tour, but more of a look-how-amazing-the-British-are tour around the world. Uh, This was in 1922 and included stops all across the globe, including South Africa, where she tried her hand at surfing. By the time she got to Hawaii, Agatha was able to pop up on her board, and this really is the fun fact of the episode, she became the first British woman to do stand-up surfing. But all doesn't stay so stellar for Agatha. In 1926, she gets two really serious setbacks. First, her mom dies, and because the two were so close, this sends Agatha into a deep depression. Then she also learns Archie has fallen in love with another woman. She files for divorce, and one night, she and Archie just get in a big old fight over it. Agatha just takes off and disappears. The next day, her car was found near a quarry with her license and her clothes inside, but no Agatha. Hmm, does the plot thicken? By now, Agatha Christie is a very big deal. So her disappearance makes front page news on the New York Times, and something like a thousand police, 15,000 volunteers, and even airplanes go out to search for her. Even Arthur Conan Doyle got in on the act and took one of her gloves to a psychic to try to get some answers. 
Well, the psychic didn't help with anything, but 10 days later, a spa hotel employee recognizes Agatha, who's been staying there the whole time. She checked in under the name Teresa Neal, and Neal happened to be the last name of her husband's mistress. Once discovered, Agatha, she left and went to hide out at her sister's and refused to talk about the situation to anyone. So no one to this day really knows why she did what she did or what was going through her mind or anything. People were absolutely fuming. They saw Agatha's meltdown as a publicity stunt or as a way to frame her husband for murder. And Agatha even tried to claim she had amnesia. But I think the use of the mistress's name doesn't really mesh with that excuse. Well, finally, almost two years later, the divorce goes through. And Archie did not waste any time. He married Miss Neal a week after the divorce papers had been finalized. Understandably, Agatha, she's pretty frustrated with her life in the UK, so she takes the Orient Express to the Middle East. And what a fortuitous trip. She not only gets the inspiration for a certain book, but she meets a couple of archaeologists who invite her to come back and dig with them. I guess that's what happened back then. So she goes back in 1930, and it's on this return trip that she meets Max Mallowan, an archaeologist who's 13 years younger than her. This is exactly what Agatha needed. She went, she, um, her and Max were head over heels. She went with him on digs and they traveled a lot together. And this inspired more novels, many of which were set in the Middle East, which was where Max was working. So I've just got one more little fun tale to wrap up Agatha's story. During World War II, she went to work at the pharmacy at University College London, and it was here that one of the pharmacists suggested using thallium as a poison. In a book. Not in real life. I hope. Anyway, this idea became a book called The Pale Horse, and as a little twist, in 1977, a doctor who had read the book helped solve a murder because he recognized the symptoms of thallium poisoning from the story. Which I just find absolutely fascinating. Agatha died in 1976 of natural causes, and in 1977, Hercule Poirot was the first fictional character to have his obituary in the paper. And that paper was the New York Times, in case that ever comes up in a trivia contest. Whew, that was quite an episode, wasn't it? Of course, there's more to Agatha's life, and if you want to get a more in-depth look into Agatha Christie's world and her works, you can go to agathachristie.com, or you will find all kinds of goodies. Okay, that is it for Agatha. Time for some writing news. My historical fantasy novel, Domna, has just been relaunched with a new cover. Of course, this update doesn't work very well for an audio bit of news, but the new cover really is eye-catching. Of course, I've got the link in the show notes if you'd like to take a look. And to celebrate the new look, I've got a 50% off sale going on the complete series. And that's all six books plus some exclusive bonus content all mashed into one ginormous book. And that sale goes through the rest of the month. And by the way, that month is September 2020 in case anybody's listening to this in the future. As for podcast news, I don't really have anything other than I've got a couple of great episodes planned for October. So fun times ahead. All right, everyone, that is it for the Book Out podcast. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, tell a friend or leave a review, and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Out podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. Audio processing by ophonic.com.